Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry for that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Kevin Lunzalu from Kenya, and I am here to present what I have been up to for the past uh, nearly 12 months of my capstone project here in Kenya. And it is titled The Plastic Crisis, a reality show we can only cancel collectively. Um, just to brief you, my capstone project was on exploring sustainable and collaborative pathways of addressing marine plastics uh, in nesting zones of um, sea turtles at um, a local beach here in Kenya. So what we're gonna do today is I'm going to show you um, really a little, I'm going to unpack the plastic crisis, the impact it has on sea turtles, then dive into my capstone projects and the learning and reflections that I got from there. So the plastic crisis is a global crisis. And um, since the inception of plastics in the 1950s, um, humanity has produced a huge amount of uh, these materials into our environment. And that is having a devastating impact on all ecosystems, whether terrestrial or marine. And most importantly, this impact um, is negatively driving the populations of some of the crucial marine species, including sea turtles. The case is not different from here in Kenya, where we are producing about 1.3 million tons of plastics each year, with only a recycling rate of about 8%. Uh, later statistics show that um, on average, Kenyans consume about 0 0.3 kgs, kilograms of plastics per day. And um, this ends up in, in, in our systems, ecosystems, and have very detrimental impact. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the populations of sea turtles and their plight in Kenya, uh, first of all, we must recognize uh, the charismatic nature of the species. Um, they're highly mig migratory and they are ancient reptiles that uh, grace our ocean waters. In Kenya, we are privileged to have six, um, I mean, five out of the seven global species. That is the green horse hawksbill, or green turtle, hawksbill turtle, loggerhead, early riddle, and leatherbacks. And here at Diani Beach, where my project is, we have three of those which nest here, uh, which are the green, hawksbill, and the uh, olive ridleys. Next slide, please. So in terms of the contribution of sea turtles to the communities that live around here uh, in Diani, first of all, sea turtles are associated with good luck, fertility, and uh, protection. Uh, they also, of course, contribute to ecosystem health uh, as herbivores, um, sea turtles regulate populations of seagrass. They stabilize um, beach. Uh, there is some research that showed that um, actually sea turtle-based tourism brings in thrice as much money than when you sell the parts, like uh, you know the meat, the uh, shell, and the eggs. And also as long-term migrants, it also help um, transport other uh, species within the ocean ecosystems like small crustaceans and some fish also, you know, hide under their shells for, to, hide, to, to avoid predation. And what does uh, plastic pollution has to do with sea turtles? So one is uh, obstruction. Um, and in this case, I'm looking primarily on the impact of, uh, you know, plastics on nesting sea turtles, because previous research has largely based on, you know, the interaction of plastics with sea turtles in the ocean, particularly, you know, juveniles and adults and things like ingestion. So in this case, what does uh, plastic pollution has to do with the uh, sea turtles nest? So obstruction largely of, um, you know, the hatchlings when they come um, from the sand, uh, they, uh, with the concentration of plastics is large on the, on the um, beach, the hatchlings are prevented from, you know, getting to the main sea and expose them to uh, predation, uh, things like birds, um, people stumbling on them, um, crabs and all that. 
entanglement of this uh, also happens of so, um, entanglement of the nesting mothers and the hatchlings. And uh, the third and the most uh, crucial one is habitat loss. So concentration, huge concentration of plastics uh, contributes to uh, a decrease in viability of nesting sites for sea turtles. Uh, next slide, please. And so having gone through that, um, sorry, I'm not able to see this slide very well. Sarah, is it my screen? Okay, right. So having gone through the plight of sea turtles and um, the plastic, the overview of the plastic um, crisis that we are in as a country and as a planet, my project had three objectives that tried to look at this and co-create solutions around that. The first objective was to test in the Kenyan context, a model that would be will fill in the policy um, relevant gaps. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, previous studies have largely centered on you know plastics and 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 sea turtles in the context of in water or in the ocean uh, environments, but not necessarily on the nesting zones of these uh, creatures. So I wanted to provide a model or co-create a model that would try to provide this data so that it can be used later to inform. Um, uh, citadel conservation and, and management of their habitats, nesting habitats in this case. The second objective was to have informal dialogues around the whole issue of plastics uh, to gain perspectives, but also insights from role players on where we are and where we are headed uh, with the plastic uh, menace that we are in, but most importantly, also conservation of citadel nesting habitats. And the third objective uh, was to use the insights from, from the ground to engage local and uh, national and some extent international um, policymakers in, 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 the, in, in opportunities that arose uh, for such. Next slide, please. And so my capstone project took place in uh, Kenya, as I mentioned before. Uh, at a county called Kwale County here at the Kenyan South Coast and um, at a beach called Diani. So Diani Beach is a beach that is quite important in terms of tourism, but also in terms of nesting of sea turtles. So three species of sea turtles nest here. And the area that is highlighted in yellow is primarily where I concentrated my efforts uh, to deliver the capstone um, project um, deliverables, but also to engage the key role players in this area. So um, as you can see, it is the, the black dots indicate uh, the nesting. So primarily where the nests, um, the, the seed turtles come to nest and the, the concentration of these dots vary um, depending on the sites. So in some, the dots are individual in some cases, they are very close to each other. They're almost forming a continuous line. And this is from data from uh, one of my capstone partners who has been not uh, documenting sea turtle nesting patterns for the past two years. So I use this as a basis of um, you know, understanding where these turtles nest so that I could gauge the concentration of plastics, but also see which are the, the, the role players or other stakeholders, if you want to use that term, that are in these zones. Next slide, please. And so I had four main deliverables for my capstone project. One is the, the creation of a plastic database. And to realize this, I uh, used um, a methodology of um, beach, cleanup and brand audit. Um, so using the map that I have shown you before, I uh, conducted several beach cleanup and brand audits and data from these beach cleanups uh, was fed into a Google sheet, which I used uh, you know, uh, as a, a tool that could be updated from time to time on the amount of litter, the type of litter, um, you know, and the potential sources of this litter. So for the identifiable litter, 
that is plastic that has um, maybe a tag that shows where it was manufactured, we could enter in, we could key in the name of the country where uh, this kind of plastic was manufactured. The second one was the dialogue on, on the future of ocean or of plastics, ocean plastics in this case. So I convened uh, actually two informal meetings with several players to discuss the impacts and the future of marine plastics in the country. The third one is to use was to use the insights from you know the beach uh, litter audit activities together with the dialogues to now inform the larger audience through various media platforms uh, on the current state and uh, probably possibly discuss the viable options of solving the plastic crisis. And the last one is the policy advocacy and, and lobbying where I would use the insights from my work to engage decision makers on the potential steps they could take to help uh, protect these crucial habitats. Next slide, please. And so um, what did I achieve with that? So one, as I mentioned, is I initiated this data set, which is currently hosted on a Google sheet, on an online Google sheet that's access, accessible by my ground partners, uh, which I hope to realize an online tool where we will transfer this data and then open it to the wider um, community so that it can be updated real time. Um, so currently we are doing it after our own internal events and, and audit activities, but I hope that this, trans, uh, this evolves into a bigger tool that is available that lives either on our website or an application that can be updated uh, real time, but by more stakeholders than just uh, us. And then um, we, through the process of course of collecting this data, we collected more than 2000 kilograms of plastics, which we then gave, it, gave to uh, a local recycler uh, called Quale Plastics uh, after, end, after the end of um, each, uh, clean up and an audit event. So how this cleanups, the process of this cleanups is that we, we gather as a community or as a group of people, we do the actual cleanup. And then after the cleanup, we do the sorting. And after, the, after sorting is when we identify which types of the plastic, for example, if it is single use water bottles, if it is uh, flip flops, if it is styrofoams, cigarette lighters, whatever the description of that plastic will be. And then we knock that one down. And after it, everything we, we weigh and then enter all this data into, uh, during the field, uh, the, the, when, we, when we're in the field, we use um, manual forms, but then later we enter them into um, the data sheet, the online data sheet. I also co-authored a paper on plastics. Uh, so this was as a result of uh, a workshop that I co-organized um, with other early career professionals from other countries. And so we were looking at what is the future of ocean plastics and how do we design collaborative frameworks that address this. And uh, this was led by Dr. Kera, who is a friend of my co-advisor, Mr. Dan Rumba, and the paper was published by the Oxford University Press. It's an open access paper that tries to engage the broader audience and looks at who is not in the room uh, in this discussion around plastics and, and, and its future. And then policy advocacy, um, and this is a uh, one of the areas that I personally feel strongly attached to because I do believe that the future of plastics depends on two things. One is our ability to collaborate with each other and bring as many diverse voices to this process as we can, but also the ability to influence the decisions that are made uh, in regards to addressing plastic pollution. One is, uh, of course, representing the voices of the communities that are on the front line of you know, the plastic 
crisis and the facing the, directly facing the impact of the plastic menace, but also speaking for the voiceless, you know, ecosystems and species like sea turtles. And so in uh, last year, I was part of the United Nations Environmental Assembly as a speaker. And that is where the resolution to adopt uh, a globally legally binding instrument on plastics was, was, was uh, adopted. And then later, because now regions and countries had to set their priorities and start engaging in this process so that the legal instrument is there by 2024, I started to engage further in this process. And the African region, the leaders from African region, the ministers of environment, uh, the ministers of environment convened in Senegal uh, last year, and they were discussing the priorities for the African region. And so I was part of a small team that was drafting uh, the discussions. And so um, I managed to propose uh, some of uh, some items based on the insights that I gained from the field, such as the recognition of informal risk speakers and the need to have incentives that give these local communities a reason to, you know, make our beaches plastic free. This year, the Kenyan government was reviewing uh, its climate action plan, uh, act, sorry, and I, through the public participation window, I also submitted some comments on the same. Apart from just those uh, items, I also uh, was featured in a number of mainstream and other media uh, speaking on the, the plight of you know, sea turtles and, and, and the situation with plastics in, in Kenya and largely. And I would, I would say that this outcomes, this project outcomes are centered on one thing, which is the need to create a strong case that communicates what the plastic pollution is doing to these critical habitats. And this is something that I gained from uh, a few years ago, the Kenyan government uh, was constructing a rail line through a national park and so many conservationists were against it. But then they were asked, what would happen if the railway line passes through the national park? What will we lose if this railway line passes through that national park? And no one was able to give a concrete answer to that. And so there is a need for us to create a concrete case that showcases what will really happen if we let the current plastic crisis continue as it is. What will we lose in terms of you know, ecosystem value, ecosystem services? Uh, what does the sea turtles bring to the table? What are the cultural values are we going to lose? And what are we going to lose in terms of the financial aspect of it? So bringing these things together uh, based on data will help us create that much needed case to stand up for, for, the, for the habitats and all uh, the sea turtles that depend on them. Next, next slide, please. So just briefly, uh, these are the main plastic items that uh, our land audit activities showed. So we have lots of single-use water bottles, uh, cigarette lighters, flip-flops, styrofoams. So styrofoams are mainly from, you know, uh, these are the things that make fishing nets float, but also they are from packaging materials, uh, mostly from shipping the shipping um, industry. And then of course we have uh, discarded fishing gear um, that forms part of the uh, top five um, things that we collect in our regular audits. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I, I included this slide because this, when I started my project, I didn't, I didn't know that I would encounter a, a lot of medical waste. I thought 
the usual suspects are the, you know, the travelers and the hotels. But during the duration of my project, I have continuously noted an increased amount of medical waste that ends up on our beach. So this is a 20 liter jerry can that is full of syringes, um, needles, test kits. I think there's a COVID test kit. You can see medicine bottles. Some of them are plastic, some of them are glass, but they all look the same. So there is a need for us to open this dialogue on plastics beyond what we deem as the usual suspects um, and bring in even the medical sector and other sectors that we do not, that do not automatically come to our minds when we talk about plastics. Next slide, please. And that is why uh, in this paper that I co-authored, we asked who is missing in this trash talk? Who is not included? And when you look at the article content, content, one of the things that we looked at is the missing stakeholders. And it is the art of bringing everybody on board that is gonna create a whole of society approach that we need when we, when we are addressing plastics and when we're co-creating solutions to plastics, because this is more complex than just the plastics that we collect on the beaches. It goes beyond just um, the dialogues, but the values that we put in our system, our production models, our consumption models, our disposal models. And that is why we are currently advocating for the legally binding instrument that countries are trying to work on to look at the entire life cycle of plastics from pre-production uh, to production to you know, consumption, supply, um, you know, disposal and recycling, and not just look at one angle because it is very complex and it goes beyond what, uh, what, what we usually look at. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, there is more to trash than what we just see on the beaches. What we, we see on the beaches is just an indicator of an, an underlining problem that is so huge, which is social and environmental injustice. So plastic pollution is an, is an environmental injustice, but it's also a social injustice. Communities, and, and, and I have worked here for the past, uh, close to 11 months, as I mentioned, and these communities that are directly dependent on marine resources um, are disproportionately affected by, um, by the plastic crisis. If you look at the, and, and I, I'll show you in the next slide, if you look at the, uh, it's actually here. If you look at our latest brand audit that happened over the weekend, uh, I put there a small screenshot under that name, social environmental justice. If you count those countries where these plastics are manufactured, you get that there are 14. Out of those 14, it's just the, the ones that come from the main continental Africa are just four. So that means that over 70% of the plastics that we collected on this day did not come from the main continental Africa. And we can, it's even worse if we break it down to maybe the regional aspect, let's say Eastern Africa or East Africa. So it means that we need to rethink the impact of plastics, not just on the environment, but also in, on, on human beings in the lenses of justice. And so we need to have the voices of these people who unfortunately are always not included in decision-making processes and dialogues that uh, revolve around plastics. Because for example, the medical waste that I showed you guys um, is directly impacting the communities that live there. They're the ones who are at the risk of, you know, getting injured by those needles and, 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 and stuff. It is the marine ecosystem that is getting jeopardized, the same ecosystem where these people get their daily livelihoods from. And so 
we have to rethink the role that countries play or producer countries play on the consumer countries or maybe the West um, producing countries which export this waste, which export the plastics to the least developed and the developing nations um, and have a sober dialogue on where we are headed. Next slide, please. Uh, this project wouldn't have been possible if not for this incredible support of my two project advisors, Dr. Catherine Sito and Dan Bromba, and my advisor from Kenya, uh, Dr. Nyawira Muziga, who is the country director of WCS Kenya. And of course, a whole lot of other people, including local communities, and other organizations that supported our cleanups. So thank you so much. Next slide, please. Thank you.